I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Adrian Arch Latin America Center here at the Atlanta Council. Um, on behalf of our center and the Global Business and Economics Center, we want to welcome the Atlanta Council today for a very t interesting and timely conversation on the 2015 trade agenda and the Trans-Pacific Partnership just days after senior uh, TPP negotiators met in New York and as a new Congress is set to begin uh, its work on, on trade issues. Um, I'd like to give a very special uh, uh, thank you today to Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi for its invaluable uh, support in, in our, in our, uh, of our trade work and of today's event. I'd also like to recognize the many uh, ambassadors who are here today. Uh, 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 of course, the ambassador from Chile who was on our panel, but also Luxembourg and, and Nicaragua among them, as well as our many board directors. Uh, we are at a critical moment for our for discussion of our trade agenda. Uh, uh, with negotiations on the TPP have advanced significantly since 2008, uh, but right now in Congress there's a question about what about TPA? Are we on the cusp potentially of some type of of of, of, uh, of movement on TPA? And I can't think of anybody that we would uh, a few people that we'd uh, that have more insight onto this than Congressman Congressman Dave Reichart. Uh, Congressman Reichart is is a sixth term representing Washington State's eighth district, and I was looking at the map yesterday. I guess that's just east of, uh, of Se the Seattle-Tacoma area. Uh, Congressman is also co-chair of the Friends of TPP Caucus, and of course he's a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee and its Trade Subcommittee. So Congressman, thank you very much for, for joining us for, for today and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Dan Price, our board director and managing director at Rock Creek Global Advisors, will have a conversation with the Congressman to, to uh, begin the, uh, the discussion. Uh, Dan served in the George Bush administration as as a senior White House <laughs> official responsible for international trade and investment. Uh, after that, I will moderate a, uh, a conversation with Ambassador Valdez, Under Secretary of Commerce Selig, uh, Sean Donna of the FT, and Ralph Carter of FedEx. Uh, so just a reminder for those of you who are tweeting, you can use the hashtag ACTrade. Uh, for those of you watching via webcast, you can also use that, web, that hashtag to uh, submit questions. So with that, please join me in welcoming Congressman Reichart and Dan Price. Thank you. Jason, thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Congressman, special welcome to you. We've got a big agenda. We've got Trade Promotion Authority. We've got the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We've got the uh, US-China Bilateral Investment Treaty. We've got the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the Trade and Services Agreement, and the Environmental Goods Agreement. <laughs> But first, and there's acronyms for each one of those. <laughs> there are, there are, which I sought to avoid initially. Uh, but first, we've got to deal with Trade Promotion Authority. And I'd like to start with that. It's been nearly eight years since TPA expired, and almost 13 since TPA was last enacted. Many of your colleagues may be unfamiliar with TPA, and certainly there's groups on both the left and the right who are concerned about giving the president authority to negotiate trade agreements that must receive an up or down vote. How are you dealing with these groups on both the left and the right on this issue of TPA? Right, so well, thank you for the question and thank you for inviting me to be here today. And um, I, uh, I just want to briefly mention my past uh, life, I was uh, in law enforcement for 33 years. So um, I like to get things done. And uh, uh, you know, cops are, are like that. So I, I look like I've been in Congress for 40 years, but I've only been here for 10. <laughs> uh, I had a career prior to this. Um, so it's, it's like anything else. I was a hostage negotiator. I was a SWAT commander. So I think those two things complement each other here in Washington, DC, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, so hostage negotiation, you know, you, you have to come, right? You have to come to some agreement somewhere and, and you want everybody to survive and be healthy and, and, uh, and go away from the, the event uh, all feeling good about uh, what, they, uh, what they accomplished and, and hopefully we save some lives and, and uh, strengthen families. And really when you get down to it and you're not quite as you know, critical as a hostage negotiation uh, scenario, but when you look at um, uh, trade uh, in the United States and you know, in our effort uh, across this globe, TPA is, is a critical, absolutely critical component. And I think most people recognize that. 
so after Korea, Colombia, Panama, of course, the discussion around TPA be began. And recognizing that TPA was needed, efforts uh, immediately started to, to try and educate people within the conference. But as you know, uh, our Republican conference and with, within the House uh, itself. But there's a lot of turnover every two years in the House of Representatives. So that education process has to continue every election cycle. New people need to be educated. There is a faction within the Republican side of um, the House of Representatives within our conference who believe that they're seceding their constitutional rights to the president when they, um, when they look at a TPA agreement. The argument, of course, is obvious for us, and that is that no, in fact, uh, what you're doing is you are up front setting parameters for the, uh, for the negotiations. And uh, that does two things. One, lets the administration know that this is what the people of the United States of America want. On behalf of the people, the House representatives, the representatives who um, study and look at these issues are saying, our people want these things from our districts negotiated uh, in, the, uh, in, in TPP or any other trade agreement. And uh, the countries, too, the countries who are negotiating with us um, require that agreement because now they know what the parameters are, too. So you can negotiate in good faith. Right now, the negotiations are occurring, and yes, progress is being made. And I'm, I'm a great friend of Ambassador Froman. I think he's doing a great job. But, uh, he realizes TPA is also needed to help Japan, Canada, and some others on specialty products get over that last little hurdle of, of finding a, a way that we can come to agreement. And um, the other way to look at it is if you don't have TPA and, and the negotiations continue and uh, we have a package that the administration presents, uh, it's not going to go anywhere in the House. Because imagine if it came to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, every member of the Ways and Means Committee would want to amend that agreement uh, because they didn't have the opportunity up front to, to create those uh, critical uh, guidelines and criteria. Everyone would want to amend the trade agreements. Well, if I was negotiating with the United States, I'd be deathly afraid of uh, of just for, you know 40 some members negotiating uh, a trade agreement, but let's say it finally got to the House. Now you have 435 people who negotiate a trade agreement. That's not going to work. And then imagine uh, the Senate getting involved. So the argument from our point of view is you have your opportunity to members of Congress. You have your opportunity to include what you want in this agreement in TPA uh, instructions, in TPA authority. So we're not seceding any power, any, any constitutional authority to the president. We're actually exercising our constitutional uh, authority and responsibility by, by designing a, 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 a instructions to the president uh, that sends a clear message to the administration and to the negotiating countries as to what the people of the United States are looking for in a trade agreement. Thank you. And Congressman, I will resist the temptation to ask you, in this scenario, who is the hostage and who are the hostage takers. <laughs> um, but can, can you give us some sense of the timing on TPA? When do you think a bill will be introduced and considered by the committee and ultimately by the full house? Uh, I, I think that uh, the, an the answer I can give to that is uh, unfortunately going to be a little bit vague. Um, it, it's it's going to be soon, though, is, is what we're hoping for. We, we're hoping for uh, spring, um, but to give you, you know, a week and two weeks or three weeks would, uh, I think, be uh, a little bit uh, impossible and sort of irresponsible. But I would say that, that uh, it's, it, it could happen soon. And uh, part of the reason I say that is that I, I happen to be a member of the President's Export Council and have been since uh, 2000, early 2010. And uh, all through uh, the discussions uh, through Korea, Panama, and Colombia, uh, and all through the last uh, couple of two, three years, the discussion has been uh, with the leaders of the Export Council, Mr. McNearney and uh, Ursula um, Bartels. Burns, yes. Um, 
they have pushed and the entire council has pushed the president uh, on TPA to get more involved. Uh, what's needed there is the president needs to get on the phone and start making some phone calls. He knows that. Um, uh, I think Mr. Froman is pushing him. The, the Export Council is, uh, has suggested that through letters. I've had personal opportunities to present my thoughts to the President during those Export Council meetings. So, uh, and yesterday, uh, some breaking news uh, for, for us uh, and for all of you, you may have heard there was a meeting yesterday uh, between Ron Kine, Mr. Meeks, uh, and some others uh, with the President on the Democrat side and talking to Mr. Kine yesterday, he was very um, upbeat and hopeful uh, as he left the White House uh, meeting with the President and in the future, um, uh, more active involvement uh, of the President in, in trying to get TPA and TPP across the goal line. Uh, that's very welcome news. Um, what can those of us in the private sector do uh, to support your efforts uh, on TPA? Yeah, that's a great question, and, the, and, and that question comes up in the Export Council, um, and, and uh, I think it's recognized, uh, I, I think, pretty widely that what's, what's needed is everyone in this room and everyone who happens to listen to this exchange, uh, you have a, a certain sphere, each one of you has a certain sphere of influence. And uh, you need to exercise that influence that you have over that sphere. And by that I mean you need to really um, be able to uh, excite the people around you about the potential of uh, TPA and what that does for TPP, uh, the potential of TPP. And not only that, the impact that on TTIP and, and other, all the other agreements that you mentioned earlier um, in, in our introduction. Um, about the jobs, you need to talk about the jobs that are created, the fact that you know, we, we want to buy American. I mean, everyone in this room wants to buy American, but we also want to sell American. And that's really, when I talk to people, selling American products really is, an, an, is one that kind of hits home. Uh, because they know that the majority, the 95% the of our market is outside of the United States. So. Uh, I, I would just suggest to everyone in here that um, wherever you live, and whatever your sphere of influence is, you talk about the, the, the products, the, whether it, they're agriculture or manufactured products, um, in your community and the impact that it'll have uh, on your ability to sell those products uh, to those, those uh, uh, countries that would be, uh, become a part of the agreement. And selling those products creates the demand for more products. This is very simple <laughs> economics, obviously. And selling and creating more products and, and, and building more products actually creates more jobs. And, uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, people should really be in support of this because we're talking about energizing this economy, growing the GDP, and, 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 and really creating relationships with the rest of the world. Exactly. So let, let's, let's go a little deeper uh, on that score and focus on some of the important commercial and economic priorities uh, in the TPP negotiations itself. Uh, from where you sit, what are those priorities and are we on track to meeting those priorities? Well, the, the number one priority, and I, I think um, uh, the President mentioned it in his State of the Union. Uh, Mr. Froman mentioned it uh, uh, just a few days ago as he testified uh, before our, our committee. Number one priority is, again, creating jobs. And creating jobs by selling American products. And when you look, so I look at the State of Washington. Um, for us, over the past 10 years, if you just look at Korea, uh, our exports to Korea have increased 125% over that 10-year period. 40% of the jobs in Washington State uh, are directly related uh, to trade. So when, when you start talking ab uh, about uh, TPP in that regard, jobs, selling products overseas, uh, some of the, the components, of course, that we look at is intellectual property protections which are absolutely critical for us. And some people, when you talk about intellectual property protections, um, 
they immediately go to high tech products. Um, but I, I share a story. I was in a, a trade meeting in Seattle on the waterfront um, not too long ago, and we were discussing intellectual property uh, rights and protection and how critical and important it is. And of course, some of our high tech companies were there, and, and certainly Boeing was there, and they have some concerns and issues, with, as obviously as they as they should have. But then a, a, a gentleman who represents a Brown and Haley Candy Company uh, in in uh, our neck of the woods, who maybe some of you recognize Almond Roca. Uh, anybody know Almond Roca? It's usually a Christmas. Okay, some nodding heads. Thank you. <laughs> Famous Washington product, um, Almond Roca. So uh, he held up a box of Almond Roca, and everybody's going, yeah, pass that box around. And, he, and what he did was, though he said, this is not made in Tacoma, Washington. This is a knockoff product made in China. So uh, when, when you think about intellectual property, it affects all products. And we talk about selling and, and increasing the number of products we want to sell. Intellectual property rights is, is really one of those critical components. Um, also included, uh, I think that uh, uh, most recognize this, are um, you know, human rights uh, issues and, and labor uh, issues, uh, environmental issues. They need to be included in, in the agreement and are included in the discussions uh, are in the process and in the process of being negotiated. So there, there are, I think, a number of advantages uh, you know, to, to these uh, as you dive down and you look at um, uh, what TPP uh, can, can do for the United States and, and for that matter, for the, for the rest of the world. I think the last thing that I'll mention, and, and most people don't immediately go there when they think about uh, some of the components of TPP and, and what it creates or the opportunity um, of creating uh, closer relationships and ties to the rest of the world and, that, and, and the national security uh, issues that are associated uh, with that. Um, some uh, over my 10 years in Congress have said, look, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna trade agreement with a certain country because they have human rights violations and uh, until they get those squared away or they have labor issues uh, or they have environmental issues uh, and, until they get those squared away, I don't wanna do a trade agreement. I have the opposite opinion is that I think that we can, we can work together and influence and learn from each other. If we have a trade agreement, it creates a relationship, an opportunity for us to talk to each other and discuss the issues that uh, might exist in a certain country. And um, let's all remember that the United States is not perfect either uh, on a lot of these issues and we can learn from other countries. So I really think trade is an opportunity for all of the things that I just mentioned, especially national security and our opportunities to learn from each other uh, is enhanced by this partnership. Uh, I, I always relate it back to, again, back to my law enforcement experience, having, uh, again, been from a patrol car to you name, you name the assignment, I've been there. If you ignore what your neighbor's doing, um, your neighborhood goes uh, you know, the wrong way. If you see things happening in your neighborhood and you don't step up and work with your community to improve it, uh, it's not going to improve. Somebody has to take the lead. That relationship and those partnerships and those friendships have to be developed within a small community. Why would not uh, that, that concept work on a global uh, basis? I, I, my argument would be that it does work on that. Uh, I really enjoy having the opportunity to meet with the, the ambassadors, the trade ministers, and the friendships that we've developed over the years uh, is, is just one example of, of uh, friendship and trust that's built just by talking to people and having that, that partnership. Exactly, exactly. Uh, let, let's pursue that a little bit. Uh, and I know you've got a hard stop, so this will be my final question to you. There's a lot of problems in the world. Uh, we see threats from various sources, from various <laughs> non-state actors. We see disparities in income around the world. What do you see as the geopolitical and strategic importance, both of TPP and of TTIP? And how will the pursuit of these agreements and their ultimate approval by Congress work to address some of these geopolitical problems. Yeah. 
I, I've, I just think that, uh, you know, the United States is uh, a, a special place. Uh, I, of course, I'm biased, as most <laughs> of us are who live here. We're blessed to live in, in, in such a, a great uh, country. And we want others to have the same that we have. I, I want my children to have uh, the life that I've enjoyed, a better life than I've enjoyed. And uh, I have the same hope and wish for all the countries in, in the world. So I guess that's one of the things that drives me is to, is, to, uh, is, is to work with countries and build that relationship, build that partnership so that everyone can enjoy and, and enjoy a higher standard uh, of, of, of life. And uh, my hope is that by building those partnerships and relationships, that, that even, even if we could even dream uh, about this uh, for a moment, even uh, an opportunity where we might have an effect on peace, that we may be able to affect this world in a way where people aren't killing each other. Uh, that is the, you know, the really the deep root of, when you talk about trade, we can talk about jobs, we can talk about the economy, it's so important, but deeper than that, uh, we are all people, all people, created by, in my opinion, God. We all have equal rights. We all should be treated equally, have the same equal opportunities across this globe. And how do we accomplish that? By working with each other and working together to make each other's lives stronger and better. In a, in a technical way, if you look at the agreement with Korea, um, you look at uh, Colombia, Panama, and now you look at the discussion around TPP. Uh, granted, we, you know, we, we have some negotiations uh, continuing with China, but intellectual property rights has been a huge issue in China. They've addressed it with some laws, but enforcing that has been a difficult uh, task for them. So um, in making these agreements, these strict intellectual property rights, these strict labor uh, uh, language um, initiatives within the trade agreements, and strict environmental uh, goals included, it really puts the pressure on China and other countries who have been resistant uh, to change uh, that kind of dramatic change. Uh, I think it brings other countries like that uh, to the forefront and it creates an opportunity for them to, to see that the rest of the world is going in this direction and we need to go in that direction also. Congressman, thank you. You certainly have a lot on your plate. You have many friends and supporters in this room and we thank you very much for taking the time this morning to share with us your views. Please join me in thanking the Congressman. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. I want, I want to again, uh, please join me again in thanking uh, Congressman Reichardt for his very candid and uh, insightful remarks uh, on where Congress is headed on, on, uh, on the trade agenda overall and, and specifically on, on trade promotion authority. As the Congressman exits the room, we're going to, we have a, we're going to do a, a quick, we're doing a quick transition here to our panel. Yeah, Ambassador, please. Um, the Congressman answered a lot of questions, but there are clearly a lot more questions out there about the trade agenda and what we should expect around TPA and TPP and what movement for the U.S. and for the hemisphere more broadly. And we have four very distinguished panel, uh, panelists with us to provide, I think, four very different uh, points of view, uh, especially with a, with, I think, with a particular Latin America focus. This is, of course, a Latin America Center uh, global business uh, 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 event, which is part of our broader Global Trade in the Americas initiative, which looks at uh, the, the crucial role that Latin America plays and the many mega regional uh, uh, trade, agreements, trade agreements being negotiated today and our, our overall trade agenda. 
Uh, you have the full bios of the panelists when you came in, but I'm going to briefly introduce each one. Uh, to the far left is uh, Chile's ambassador to the United States, uh, Juan Gabriel Valdez. Uh, ambassador Valdez has an extensive history of diplomatic postings, and many may not know actually two things about him. One is that he coordinated the No Television campaign that brought an end to military rule in Chile, which doesn't have anything to do with today's discussion, but I think it's, it's uh, uh, very important to point out for the, the history of his country and, and the crucial role that he played that. But more pertinent today's to discussion is that while he was at the Foreign Affairs Ministry, he played a key role in forging Chile's free trade agreements with the United States and with Canada. Uh, to my immediate left is Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade, Stefan Selig. Uh, Under Secretary Selig leads the International Trade Administration and is well known to many of you, uh, even though he has actually only been uh, on the job for, for eight months. Uh, might might, might, might see like, seem like two years rather than eight months, but it's uh, eight months and he has made incredible strides in moving forward the agenda at Commerce in his, in his short time. Uh, before government, he spent nearly 30 years in banking, uh, I think most recently at, at Bank of America. Uh, to uh, the undersecretary's left is Sean Donnan. Sean is the world trade editor at the Financial Times, where he leads the FT's coverage of trade and development globally. Uh, Sean previously served as a world news editor, uh, according to the FT's international economic and political news coverage. Sean is also uh, a recent uh, transplant to Washington, uh, three weeks in Washington. So, um, so I guess, uh, Stefan, you can share with Sean some of your knowledge of, of, of living in Washington. Um, and then to uh, uh, Sean's left is Ralph Carter. Ralph is the Managing Director of Trade and International Affairs at FedEx. He is responsible for coordinating FedEx's international regulatory affairs. Uh, and above all, I think he has his fingers on the pulse of the needs of FedEx's small business customers, which is very important to our discussion today. I'm going to begin the discussion by looking at how close we are to getting a deal and what should be expected as we approach the end goal. We'll then move on to what TPP may mean for existing and new trade relationships, as well as how it could affect small businesses and countries beyond the United States. We're going to try and keep our conversation to draw crucial nuggets because these, these are very critical few months. I think as, as Congressman Reichert uh, mentioned in his, in his, in his uh, remarks, I think the, the meeting with uh, uh, Congressman Kind and, and Congressman Meeks and others at the White House yesterday uh, is real, uh, hopefully real, shows the, the real momentum that might be coming uh, for moving forward on, on TPA. I'm going to conduct this as much of a conversation as, as possible. I've told the panelists beforehand, don't feel like you have to always go through me to, to have a, a, a comment. Uh, feel free to, to directly engage with each other. And again, if you're tweeting, use the hashtag uh, ACOpenTrade. So, um, Stefan, I'll start with you. We heard uh, President Obama mentioned the State of the Union. Congressman Reichart mentioned it uh, in his remarks just now. His, the full un and unequivocal support for TPA in order to complete both the Pacific and Atlantic uh, trade agreements. Um, the, ide the idea that, that trade is an administration-wide effort is something that Congressman uh, that was en echoed in Congress last, last week by Ambassador Froman. Beyond the meeting that happened yesterday, how is the administration's full court press shaping up? What should we be expecting from the administration in the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months? Uh, thanks, Jason, uh, for having uh, me today. I guess I would say, um, as you have probably heard, uh, the administration and the president is all in um, on this topic. Uh, the president has been directly engaged with members of Congress on the importance of trade agreements for the U.S. economy and for jobs. And he has asked his entire economic cabinet um, uh, to join him uh, in doing that. Uh, Secretary Pritzker uh, has um, been, uh, uh, been regularly talking to members of Congress, as have I. Um, in fact, uh, before the congressman left, I was going to remark to him that just the week before last, I was in the Seattle area uh, talking to members of Congress about the importance of the trade agreements that we are, we are currently um, uh, discussing. Um, so every speaking opportunity um, that I have, uh, this will be part of uh, what I will be talking about. And I think the congressman was quite right in um, uh, central to that is making sure that um, there is an informed dialogue um, uh, on these topics. And part of having that informed dialogue, frankly, is having business leaders and thought leaders like the Atlanta Council, like members of your audience today, um, uh, being participants in that discussion uh, to really give um, uh, additional uh, credibility and additional support to what the administration is uh, uh, completely behind. Sean, you, you're, you're, you're in the position now, we were joking beforehand, that we're, we're asking you the questions rather than you as a journalist asking the questions. So I'm going to ask the first 
question, follow-up question to that to you. you as a journalist covering trade, uh, you have a unique vantage point, um, perhaps more unique than some of the legislators or, or, or trade negotiators uh, uh, who, are, who are oftentimes in the, in the weeds on some of these issues. H how do you see from, a, uh, from your vantage point the negotiations going really for both for, for TPP, but also, of course, with the Atlanta Council, so of course, for, for TTIP as well. And are we close, as close to a deal on TPP as, as some claim, especially uh, as we were talking about uh, with the Congressman, especially with TPP still up in the air? TPA, excuse me, TPA, still up in the air. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, it is indeed an uncomfortable position for me not to be asking the questions. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I should, uh, I, I'm tempted to say that everything I say here is off the record, of course, but uh, uh, the, uh, 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 but uh, but that would be uh, hypocritical. I mean, the journalists are never uh, hypocritical. Uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, on the TPP, I think that there, there, there's two points to remember. One, this is not something that started yesterday. It's something that started, uh, depending on where, where you count, a decade ago. Uh, the U.S. essentially joined the discussion seven years ago, started actively negotiating five years ago, uh, and for the last 18 months, we've been hearing from uh, for, for, from negotiators that uh, that something is very close, uh, and that leads to some suspicion in some of us when when we hear it all over again. But actually, you know what? The the, the signs are there that, that we really are close to something. Uh, the uh, uh, Paul Ryan uh, uh, was meeting with a, with a small group of us uh, trade reporters yesterday on on the Hill, and he laid out a pretty clear uh, scenario where you get TPA passing in the spring, a vote on TPP uh, in the fall, uh, and uh, uh, if you work backwards from that, you really need to get these negotiations done in March, April, perhaps May uh, at the latest. And that's where Ambassador Froman is talking about a very small number of months uh, there. Andrew Robb, the Australian trade minister, in an interview on, on Australian radio uh, yesterday said it's a matter of weeks. Uh, Tim Grosser, the New Zealand trade minister, uh, has talked about a, a matter of months. Everyone is, is clearly focused on getting this done uh, very quickly. And you talk to the negotiators, uh, and they're strangely uh, positive <laughs> about this, given some of the issues they still have to get over. But uh, everyone is, is clearly focused on getting this done uh, in the next couple of weeks. The crucial, there's, there's two crucial elements. I mean, I think the, the, the first is we're seeing the administration really uh, mount this full court press, and I think that's very important politically here. And it's important for the second element, which is TPA, that has to pass, and it has to pass fairly quickly in order to close TPP quickly. So that's really what we're, uh, the next step we're waiting for. Love your, love the optimism, Sean. Ambassador Valdez, it's, I think it's also important to understand the context of potential benefits for some of our, our key trading partners as well, given that Latin America is the U.S.'s fastest growing uh, uh, trade partner. And I think one thing that's oftentimes left out of the discussion, especially in Washington, is how, how are the negotiations being viewed in some of the other partner countries uh, um, as part of the agreement. Can you give, please give some insight on, on how TPP the, is being viewed in Chile, uh, especially as, as Sean is saying, especially as we, we might be near the, the, the goalpost? And, and are you seeing a similar debate in Chile, maybe among the business community or others, as, as we're seeing here in, here, in, here in the United States? Well, thank you very much for having me, first of all. And um, let me say that we are extremely we are extremely committed to the to a good finalization of the TPP. We really believe it would make uh, an enormous difference for the Latin American countries involved in the process uh, that if it succeeds. But I have also to say that uh, in terms of the perception in our countries of the advantages that TPP has in comparison to the free trade agreements we have already signed with the United States, with Canada, with Europe, and with China, and with Japan. Chile has signed 24 free trade agreements with 62 countries. Therefore, this is not news to us. And we have accumulated a certain experience on trade agreements during <laughs> the last uh, 20 years. We have been, as I said before, accused of trade promiscuity. <laughs> Therefore, uh, we understand very well that trade uh, agreements succeed when the sensibilities of the partners are taken into consideration. And we have an enormous effort to do, a domestic effort, to persuade 
our uh, business sector, that this goes in favor of the Chilean economy and in favor also of the integration of partners in Latin America that are working together in this effort. I refer to Mexico, uh, Peru, uh, Colombia, that in my modest opinion should be in this negotiation, mm -hmm. and uh, also Chile. The Pacific Alliance is extraordinarily interested in our relationship with Asia. From our point of view, this is obvious. China is our main trade partner. We want better rules. We, were, we want more transparency. We want to have uh, rules from the 21st century. We want to participate in this effort. But at the same time, we have to persuade our public opinion that the, 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 the deal is fair, that our concerns and our sensibilities are being taken into account. Mm -hmm. In this context, TPA is absolutely essential to finish this negotiation. There will be no agreement without a TPA. And this is critical not only to us, it is critical to most of the other partners in the negotiation. Therefore, we are doing also our effort in Congress to persuade the American Congress that this is a good deal for the United States and also for US partners in Latin America and in the world. My perception is that we will be successful, but I do not necessarily share what Sean was saying about this mysterious optimism that one says, <laughs> sees sometimes in Washington and which, in my opinion, means months of work, not weeks of work. <laughs> Well, I guess time is all relative when you're talking about trade negotiations, of course. right? Um, and I think, you know, also interesting, you know, on the, on the uh, ambassador's point is that, you know, every trade agreement really since 1973, except for one, is actually uh, has been negotiated, uh, inc concluded and signed when, when TPA is in effect. So it shows the importance for our partner countries of, of having TPA. Uh, Ralph, uh, from FedEx's perspective, what do, what do you see as some of the main benefits of TPP and, and, and international trade more generally? more generally for your clients, especially for the small businesses. You know, I think that oftentimes uh, trade agreements are thought of as, as solely benefiting large corporations, the multinationals. How can something like TP, TPP uh, be beneficial for uh, your, your many SME clients? Sure, thanks, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, yeah, we've got, uh, I think, a pretty unique vantage point <clears throat> on how trade and, and globalization is, is operating out there. We've been in 220 countries and territories around the world for many years, because we see this kind of firsthand. Uh, and in our experience, countries that are more open to trade uh, perform better than those that are closed to trade. Uh, and I think, I think all the research backs that up. It's really about, I think, two things, specialization and search for growth. Uh, the global supply chains are allowing countries and companies now to specialize and to do what they do best and to find markets around the world to get those products into the global supply chain. And this has created opportunities around the world, uh, which, which are a big part of our business. We help to enable all of that global supply chain to function. You know, 60% of today's trade is in component parts. That shows you what's going on, is that specialization uh, is how the global economy works. And things aren't made in one country anymore. They're made in many countries. The second piece is it's, it's a search for growth. Uh, if you're a, a developed country and your markets are, are mature, you've got to find the consumers that are out there growing and buying your product. Uh, and so the developed countries want to find access to developing markets uh, and the 4.9 billion uh, middle class consumers that are out there, vice versa, if you're a developing country, you want to find access, you want to get access into those developed countries uh, who can afford to buy your products. Uh, and so it's kind of a win-win. Both sides are winning uh, in, in, in the trade, uh, in, in the trade uh, model that we see out there. And in terms of TPP itself, uh, you know, the traditional trade agreements do several things to help uh, businesses uh, to uh, tap into these, these growth markets. I mean, one, it makes your, your products more competitive, reduces the tariffs. So you've got a preference over other countries who are trying to also get in those markets. Uh, you know, the U.S. is already very open to trade. Our tariffs are very low. But we face the highest tariff barriers around the world for our products. 
And so what these agreements do is knock down those barriers and, again, make it easier for U.S. companies to sell into those markets. They also come up with strong rules to make sure that there's not discrimination against our products, that we have a fair shot at competing for goods and services in those markets. Uh, and then, of course, trade also, uh, on the inbound side, uh, exposes uh, markets to competition. Uh, and that makes your, your companies more efficient, more competitive, and it makes your consumers uh, happier. They've got more choice, more quality, and, uh, and lower prices. So TPP does several things. You know, it, it does uh, tariffs and services. It has rules on investment. It's got rules on IPR and labor and environment. Uh, and customs and express delivery, you know, it makes sure that we can go out there and provide the services that we need for our customers to help them access these markets in a, in a timely and, and reliable fashion. Uh, but this agreement is also going further than agreements have in the past. Uh, we've talked a lot about 21st century agreements, and TPP will be an improvement over past uh, agreements in a lot of different ways. One of which, for example, is data flows. We're trying to secure the movement of data across borders so that we don't have requirements that make companies house specific servers in countries. Uh, as you can imagine, the flow of data across the world is how the modern business operates. And trying to balkanize and, and, and locate these, these servers in specific countries is really going to put a big uh, crimp in how these systems work. Uh, and it's just not really feasible. But yet we see pressure to do this. And so that's one of the things that TPP is trying to, uh, trying to address. It's also going to address state-owned enterprises for the first time, really, in a comprehensive way, to try to make sure that state-owned enterprises in these markets act in a commercial manner and don't, have, don't benefit from undue preferences uh, that, again, put our companies and products at a disadvantage. Uh, it's going to look at uh, new IPR uh, improvements to look at new pharmaceutical things like uh, biologics, try to, try to make sure that the U.S. Uh, who leads in these, these products, that their, their intellectual property is being protected around the world. Uh, and finally, there's also going to be a new emphasis on SMEs, trying to make sure that SMEs can benefit from these trade agreements. Uh, and it does that by trying to make them more transparent, uh, trying to raise awareness, trying to promote uh, the agreements within the SME uh, community. So TPP is going to do a lot to help our customers uh, who are interested in, in accessing these markets. And I think a lot of those examples are things that I know FedEx has worked with the Atlantic Council on a report on TTIP and how that could help uh, SMEs. Absolutely. So, uh, a, lo a lot of those kind of those parallels can potentially be be drawn to the on the TPP front. Uh, Stefan, you've 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 been crisscrossing the world recently. Um, you were, you, know, you have your eight months in, in in Washington, but probably I don't know, maybe only half that time actually actually in Washington. Everywhere from Asia to Latin America, uh, at least recently leading a trade mission to I believe Peru and, and Colombia in, in November. Uh, what are you seeing going you know going well with some of the FTAs that we currently have in force? And I think how could new agreements? How could actually actually TPP specifically? How could that? help to update some of our agreements to really bring even more opportunities for the American people? Um, well, look, I'd start out by saying um, FTAs uh, are working. Um, trade in countries where we have FTAs are growing almost twice as fast as those countries where we do not, 5% versus 3%. Um, uh, and uh, today, I can actually announce that um, our Last year's uh, export numbers uh, are, have just been released, and we will set record levels of exports to FTA countries um, uh, up 4.3% um, uh, up, uh, from 2013, reaching levels of $765 billion. Um, overall, uh, we've set record levels of exports this year of $2.35 trillion in goods and services, which is up 2.9%. So you see growth in the FTA markets is, is dramatically higher than in, in non-FTA markets. You mentioned uh, Peru and Colombia. Um, uh, Colombia also, we set record levels of exports um, uh, last year. And in Peru, where we've uh, uh, just passed the fifth anniversary of our FTA, um, exports have uh, more than doubled to $10 billion from where they were prior to uh, signing that free trade agreement. So, so these agreements are working. Uh, as it relates to TPP, TPP will be... Um, uh, I think, as the ambassador suggested, a best-in-class 
uh, trade agreement. Uh, there are going to be a whole host of things that we haven't seen in trade agreements before. Uh, for example, uh, environmental and labor uh, chapters will be included in the corpus of these agreements, which have not been, been the case before. Um, uh, and so as we say in the Department of Commerce, this is not my uh, grandfather Chevrolet mm -hmm. um, trade agreement. These are really the most modern, updated trade agreements um, that are really set for the 21st century and set for an economy, frankly, that's wildly different than when NAFTA and other trade agreements um, uh, were, were conceptualized and um, uh, signed into law. And Ambassador, how, how do you see the US-Chile FTA went into force in, in, in 2004, so over 10 years ago. Uh, actually, the first one between the U.S. and a South American country. How do you hope TPP would, would build on this FTA? What, what could be some of the new opportunities that TPP could potentially uh, unleash? The, 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 the free trade agreement between Chile and the U.S. has been extremely successful. Uh, it, it, we, are, we are at present in, in zero tariffs. We have 100% free trade with the United States on the 1st of January of this year. Therefore, we are not hoping for amelioration in trade in goods. We understand perfectly well what uh, the Undersecretary was saying. We would like to complement and improve our FDA. Uh, we understand perfectly well the importance of tariff barriers have, di have diminished in recent years. And what we are looking at is clear and better standards in non-tariff barriers. We want to have better sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and we want regulatory matters to be better. In that sense, the idea of accumulating origin in the agreements is something extremely important to uh, create some sort of um, uh, uh, value chain, uh, chain of value in our Asia-Pacific area, Latin America, Asia-Pacific area. Therefore, Given that the trade in services between Chile and the United States is the most important part and the most successful part of our agreement at present, the idea of having new rules that can push forward trade in services is something that is also of great interest to Chile. Of course, there are some issues we wouldn't like to change from the present mm. FTA agreement, but that is part of the negotiation, and I'm not in that. <laughs> Um, Under Secretary Sale, you, you, what are you hearing from some of our TPP partners and negotiations come to a, a, the final stage? You know, we're at the Atlantic Council, so we should also ask about, about TTIP as, as, as well. But how are, how are these talks going in your opinion? You know, Sean, Sean is, is, is very optimistic that we're, we're, we're nearing, nearing the goalpost. Do you, do you share that same optimism? Look, we, we've made, um, and negotiators have made a tremendous amount of progress. And so um, I guess uh, I would combine what both of the comments were, which is substantial progress has been made. Uh, but there are some very tough issues that are remaining. And as a lifelong negotiator, um, I would tell you this is not uncommon that the toughest issues to negotiate are saved for the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we are. Um, uh, you know, that being said, um, I think as important as anything that we will can be doing is having an informed debate about these topics uh, and getting TPA passed, which has um, been uh, emphasized this morning, is going to be critical to allow um, uh, our negotiators to bring the best deal um, to Congress uh, for a vote and maximize the chances of success. Um, uh, you know, negotiating bilateral deals are tough, um, but when you have 11 parties that you're trying to negotiate with, it is extraordinarily difficult. Um, uh, I described it the other day as putting socks on an octopus, uh, and that's really <laughs> what it is. Uh, it is an extraordinarily <laughs> difficult endeavor, um, uh, but I think we are nearing the end game. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one of the issues, Sean, that's come up as we're, as we're nearing this end game, uh, especially with the dollar strengthening sharply, which I think, you know, is testament to the export numbers, uh, uh, Stephan, that you're giving with, the, those, are, those are in the context of a, of a, of a, strengthening, a strengthening dollar. The, there are calls for protections against currency manipulations as part of the, uh, as part of the, the TPP discussions. Um, what are your thoughts on the idea of introducing language on currency manipulation into TPP at this stage? Is that, is this the right, is this the right vehicle? Is TPP the right vehicle for doing that? Uh, what would be the effect on the negotiations? This is obviously a very, uh, very political uh, 
uh, subject. So, so uh, look, I, I think currency is is one of, uh, of the hot issues that hasn't been raised in the TPP negotiations so far, and that's quite deliberate by, by the administration. I think it's a hot political issue here in Washington and here in the U.S., so particularly the auto sector uh, pushing it and so on. But the administration's made quite clear, uh, at least in its body language, uh, that it does not want to be talking about uh, currency in the TPP context and that it does not want to be putting uh, th this issue in, in, into trade agreements. That doesn't mean it's not going to be in there in, in, in some form. I think what, what, what you're going to have to see uh, is, I mean, I think there's going to be two stages in terms of addressing this. One, th there was uh, currency manipulation language in the TPA that expired uh, in 2007. Uh, that language will be in there again. Uh, you should expect that language to perhaps be a little bit stronger. Uh, I think we will see the administration uh, and, and then the second step uh, uh, of the discussion is going to be the real question of, of, and I think the administration is betting that they can get through this, of, of if you don't have a currency chapter in the TPP. I don't think there will be a currency chapter in the TPP. It's just too late in the negotiations. There's too many people uh, 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 on the other side of the table or around the table uh, who get very prickly about this. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, but if you don't have a currency chapter in there, are are the, is that majority of House members and Senate uh, uh, and senators who uh, signed this letter in 2000, these letters in 2013 calling for uh, enforceable chapters, are they going to they hold that line or are they going to look at the broader agreement and say, look, we've got a really good deal here. Uh, the administration doesn't. We don't have currencies, but are we going to kill this deal over this one issue? I think the administration's betting that uh, that they can win that agreement, uh, that 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 argument, and they can get that vote through. Jason, I think there's one very important point here, which really does relate to currencies, which is you know the dollar has strengthened dramatically over the course of the last year. It's up roughly 15 percent against global currency indexes, roughly up 15 percent against the euro. And so the question is, what are we going to do to help American companies export? in that environment. Yeah. And so I think many of us think the dollar is likely to remain strong given stagnant global economies around the world and the relatively improving prospects of the United States versus Europe and Asia and other economies. So that is going to be the reality of the dollar. And given the importance of export markets for U.S. companies, are we going to assist them in allowing them to be more, more effectively access foreign markets through reducing trade barriers and non-tariff barriers, or are we not? And that really is what we're talking about in terms of TPA and TPP. And it's also worth pointing out that three, four years ago, uh, the U.S. was the target of the complaints in terms of currency. That's true. Uh, That's in true. terms of the Fed's quantitative easing program, you know, Guido Mantega, when he was talking about the currency wars uh, three, four years yeah. ago, was talking about the U.S. and the Fed. Uh, and what we're seeing uh, Europe do now, uh, later, what we're seeing Japan do in, in, in recent years, what we're seeing others do, is quite simply what the Fed was doing uh, four or five years yeah. ago. Yeah. Another point, too, is you have to, in any negotiation, uh, you know, uh, Stefan was using the analogy of putting socks on octopus. You have to pick and choose your battles, too. And obviously, currency manipulation is not going to, is not going to, well, unlikely to be one of those battles. But what are the, what are the key things for the negotiators for, for the negotiators that that are, that are critical to move on, move the goalpost on? So I, I mean, we've heard about IP. Uh, IP is going to be one of the one, one of the final issues. Uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, disciplines for state-owned enterprises are going to be there. There's still a, a you know, people talk about the TPP and the 21st Century Agreement, and really, you, you have to think of, of the TPP in terms of two components. There is this, the kind of big 12-country rules discussion, which gets into intellectual property, labor and environmental standards, uh, disciplines for state-owned enterprises, and so on. And then there's a market access component, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is the old-fashioned uh, 19th century uh, discussion, uh, as, as some people have put it. Uh, the, uh, and, and that is what we're seeing. You know, that's the bilateral discussion that's happening this week uh, between the Japanese and, and, and the Americans here in, 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 in Washington, and that's focused on pork, beef, rice, auto parts, uh, some simple things like that. And, the, and that part of it is still hanging out there. The Canadians are, are holding back in terms of a, a, of a market access offer. That's annoying some people. Uh, the, uh, there are others who are waiting to see just exactly how, how the Japanese uh, come out, how open uh, yeah. Th yeah. they get on these kind of five sacred uh, pro product yeah. areas that they've, that they've talked about. So, you know, there are still big elements there, but what happens, or what I'm told tends to happen in, in, in these trade agreements by the negotiators is, look, we've spent seven years thinking about how we're going to close a deal. 
and then you get to the last month and you kind of push those plans and mm -hmm. you have late yeah. nights, everyone gets their sleeping bags out and right. drinks a lot of coffee and, and uh, we get the deal done. Right, right. Uh, Ralph, many S SMEs have not actually taken full advantage of our, of our current FTAs. Can you ex explain a little bit what, why that is? Why, why, why uh, you know, a small business in uh, Tennessee or, or, or Missouri or whatnot um, hasn't been able to take advantage of, and what can be done to make it easier for some of these small companies uh, to export and invest abroad, and maybe even some some concrete examples of, of what really what are some specific tangible things that can really help to uh, promote small. I mean, small business, of course, the engine of the of our economy. Sure, it's a it's a great question and one that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, we see huge opportunities uh, for for many many years uh, for SMEs to step up their participation in the global uh, economy and export more. You know, just some statistics that come from uh, Stefan, Stefan's group. Uh, you know, there are 23 million SMEs uh, in the United States, uh, and they account for all the bulk of new private sector jobs, and, and they now account for some 35% of exports. And the number of SMEs that have started to export has grown uh, fairly dramatically in the last, in the last several years. Uh, and we find that SMEs tend to, uh, that export, tend to pay more tend to grow faster, uh, tend to create more jobs, uh, and tend to survive longer. Uh, and at FedEx, we see that experience as well. Uh, our experience supports those. Uh, we've looked at this, and uh, in and, uh, and our customer base, it looks like we have some 23% of our SMEs export. And within that group, we see that they're doing a lot better than those SMEs that don't export. Uh, they grow faster, they tend to be larger, uh, and especially their domestic business grows faster than SMEs who don't export. So there are these kind of synergies out there that, that illustrate that exporting makes companies stronger by creating more opportunities, we think. And we work very hard to help our SME customers uh, tap into these foreign markets and work through all of the, uh, the red tape that's involved uh, in exporting. Uh, but on the other side, uh, again, of those 23 million, uh, only about 1% really are exporting. Now, of course, there's a lot of companies in that 23 million, like a barbershop, that's not going to export. But the fact is that we don't have as many SMEs exporting as we could have and as we should have. And that's where we see a huge opportunity. There are a lot of reasons why an SME may not export. Uh, primarily, they're focused on domestic business, trying to grow as much as they can in the United States, and they simply don't have the resources and the time to tackle and get their head around all of the complexities uh, involved in trying to export. Uh, it's difficult to find distributors. It's difficult to get paid sometimes. Uh, it's difficult to get finance. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to comply with regulatory regimes that you're not familiar with. <coughs> Uh, and uh, as Jason mentioned, there was an Atlantic Council paper that we worked on with them uh, that had several examples uh, of, a, of an American company that made some safety equipment, and they looked in, in, into selling in Europe, and they had to go through this entire certification process, uh, which was quite complex uh, and quite burdensome and expensive. The same thing for a, an equipment, kind of a health equipment, exercise equipment uh, manufacturer that sold into hospitals had to go through uh, very complex certification processes to sell the product uh, into Europe. And these are upfront costs before they've realized any sales. And so for a small company, that's a big burden. That's yeah. a big obstacle to clear. Uh, you may say, well, I'm going to spend all this money to get my products certified, and I'm not going to know whether I'm going to sell any or not. So these kinds of things are, are part of the problem that we need to tackle. And the TPP is, is going to tackle it. I think TTIP is putting an even bigger emphasis on regulatory coherence, cooperation, looking at this concept of mutual recognition so that uh, a, a US uh, manufacturer trying to sell into Europe doesn't have to go through all those same procedures in, in Europe because Europe will say, we recognize that the US procedures are equivalent or are the same, the same standard in terms of safety. Uh, that then makes it a lot easier for these, these, these companies to start exporting. And I always say, Ralph, or, or 
already seeing that with um, uh, SMEs in uh, where we have FTAs. Um, so FTAs in particular, uh, SMEs in particular benefit for FTA, from FTAs. And the um, SME share of uh, exports uh, in FTA markets often exceeds 33% now, which is the average overall. Um, so I think those issues um, are uh, being addressed most profoundly where, where we have free trade agreements, and that, I think, underscores the importance of yeah. TPP. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I mean, you look at, you know, large corporations have the ability to try to kind of, you know, the whole departments have to try to manage the rules and manage kind of how to, how to enter into different countries, but, you know, small businesses, they don't, they don't have that oppor opportunity, and so that's it's a real right. uh, potential uh, uh, advantage that, that the, uh, the agreement could bring. I want to turn... Go ahead, Ralph. Well, no, we can come back to it. I was going to talk about the, the power of e-commerce. I want to be sure to get okay, to we'll that. Come, we'll come, I want to turn back to the ambassador and, and um, look, you know, ask you to speak, put, put you in, a in an uncomfortable position of having to speak for the hemisphere. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and more broadly, you know, what is beyond for the U.S. or for Chile, what do you see as some of the key benefits from TPP more broadly for, 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 for obviously there's only, uh, uh, you know, Chile, Peru and Mexico that are currently part of the, the TPP negotiations. We've talked about how we think, you know, Colombia should be part of those negotiations, but how could TPP more broadly affect uh, uh, the, the hemisphere? Uh, Socioeconomic development, what kind of, how, how what, what type of kind of the rules that it puts in, puts in place, how could those help to, to bring additional uh, rules to the hemisphere? I wouldn't like to get, to get into the technical matters, but um, because they belong to the negotiation. But let me explain to you why we are committed to a negotiation of this type. There, there, is first, there is first a reason of pragmatism, of course. We have been pragmatic in our approach to the, to the globalization process, and we have signed agreements that are extremely comprehensive, and some other agreements which are very modest in terms of what they wanted to achieve. The second reason is because we are, or are we, we have always wanted to be perfectly aware of the geopolitical elements which are behind these negotiations. There is no trade without a geopolitical vision behind it. And in this case, you have to consider that Latin America uh, has changed enormously from the moment in which China became uh, a very, very important partner and a very, very important actor in the world scene. Chile is a Latin American country, but is realizing or has been realizing for some time that it is a Pacific Ocean country. And uh, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico are all, all, also thinking in the same way. Therefore, an agreement which tends to regulate the way in which the Asia Pacific region will develop an agreement which tends or wants to regulate, in fact, the way in which the U.S. will relate to China and to the other actors in the Asia-Pacific region, region is obviously very important to us, even if we are a very small yeah. economy. This is the first point. The second point is that from a foreign policy point of view, we cannot see Latin America divided as the king of Spain and the king of Portugal did some centuries ago <laughs> in the Treaty of Tordesillas between the Pacific and the Atlantic. We understand that some of our countries have a vision of certain vision of trade and uh, their insertion in the world uh, economic scene. Some others have different opinions. But we are working very uh, strongly to approach to, to get close uh, countries like Brazil uh, and the uh, Pacific area and the, Paci the Pacific Alliance. We want to work with Mercosur in those areas in which we can work together. And uh, this has to do with the Asia-Pacific area, of course, because Brazil is a very important partner of China. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have developed, uh, or we are developing, a vision of the region inserted in the Pacific, which I think um, is, 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 is very considerable as an element 
in our decision to join TPP and to work in favor of it. I want to thank you, Ambassador. I want to. We we have about 20, 15, 20 minutes remaining. I want to make sure to open up to questions from the uh, audience, or if you're on Twitter, you can use uh, the hashtag #ACOpenTrade. As you're thinking about your first question, though, I think just on the ambassador's point, you know, Chile is in a really unique spot because Chile is a you know member of the Pacific Alliance, a member of, of the mm -hmm. TPP negotiations, a, a member of a member of Mercosur as well, and and so Chile really has a mm -hmm. kind of a. Free trade. With the United States. And of course, a free trade department with the United States. So Chile, kind of looking across the hemisphere, is really at this unique vantage point of being able to bring countries together. And That's I right. think there's, I mean, there's another important point. I mean, you talk about the, the view from the hemisphere, but you, let's go even further out and talk about the view of the world. I mean, it, it's going to, one of the, the key points about TPP and the other mega regional agreements, TTIP, uh, the Pacific Alliance, uh, and, and others, is the competitive tension that they've put in uh, into the, the global trading system. The, the fact is, multilateral trade negotiations are frozen. And have been frozen for uh, for some time now, and this is the alternative that's um, that, that's emerging now. Uh, Jagdish Bhagwati used to talk about the noodle bowl of of bilateral trade agreements. I like to patent a phrase, uh, and I like to talk about the ravioli plate. Uh, the uh, uh, we're, you know we're regionally really these these mega regional agreements are kind of bringing together the noodles into in, in, into raviolis, and someday you might stitch them together and you might get the lasagna, right? And then, and, the, and and the lasagna is the big multi multilateral agreement that, that you're talking about. But start thinking about it, and that, that you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, that this is a long-term project we're talking about. It's a, it's a decade or more uh, that, that you'd be talking about. But you take TPP, 40% of global output. You add TTIP, yeah. you start getting a majority of the global economy. You throw in the Pacific Alliance. Uh, and it only grows, right? And then you bring in ASEAN, and you start uh, so, so some, so, so some other things. You start getting very close to a big multilateral uh, agreement it, on one side. The other, th the other question is, is going to be, and in Geneva, this really makes people nervous, and you're starting to see, again, some, some movement, creeping movement on the Doha round, uh, and, and you might actually, at some point, get something there, although please don't bet on that. Uh, that uh, uh, that's not a, a bet I would recommend. I sometimes think about farfalle as well. Um, farfalle is uh, the, yeah, halfway to ravioli. Halfway to <laughs> ravioli. There, there's, a, you know, I, there's other questions that I have, but I'll turn it over to the audience. You know, we didn't talk yet about uh, on the e-commerce front or actually some of the concerns about the about TPA and TPP and how do you try to how do you address those those, those different concerns? We have first question all the way there in the back. If you could please say your name and your affiliation and, and then get your question. Sure, I'm Robert Shredder, president of International Investor. We're, we're fairly neutral in this, but. But being in business, we uh, we always look for measurable results. So my question for the panelists is, for those of you who are confident this would be good for us, can we measure it simply in terms of um, if this agreement passes, would you tie your salaries to the equation of if exports outgrow imports to the U.S., it's a success. Your salaries go up. If imports outpace exports to these 11 nations, your salaries will adjust accordingly. T tough question, Robert. Who wants to? Well, as uh, somebody who went to work for the government, I'm not sure I should be betting my salary on anything at the moment. Um, uh, on the one hand, on the on the other hand, I think actually it is not the right question, and it's not the right question because this is a relative argument. And the question is not what are the absolute numbers, because there's a whole host of things, as, as I think business folks understand, that go into um, the ability for companies and economies to successfully export and import that are fundamentally out of, out of their control. I think actually the question is, are we giving US companies all of the tools to be most effective to sell their goods and services overseas to wildly expanding markets that are going to represent significant opportunities that they haven't had to fundamentally deal with in the past. And that, I think, is the purpose of these trade agreements, the purpose of TPP, and um, uh, the purpose of TTIP. And so um, I appreciate the fact that you're neutral. I am not. Uh, I am a wild supporter of these agreements because I think they fundamentally are, are, um, are tools to help companies compete effectively and for American companies to take advantage of their comparative advantages around the world. I think there's, I mean, there's another point to make, which is that w we tend to measure trade in the wrong way nowadays. Uh, we've talked about, uh, we, we, we've heard about global value chain. 60% of the trade in the world today uh, is in 
component parts uh, crossing borders to be assembled by someone else and then cross another border. The OECD and the WTO have done some really fascinating work on trade and value added uh, and a different way of, of, of measuring trade. When you start looking at it in that way, the relationship between the US and China looks very different. Uh, and that is, in, in, in a world of global value chains, I think we should be thinking not as a kind of zero sum game exports versus imports, but we should be thinking about really the role in a global economy and how the trade and value added uh, flows work. That's an important point. I mean, the fundamental nature of how we think about trade has, has changed in the, last, in the last decade. It's wrong. Yeah. 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 Uh, OK, a bunch of questions. The first question actually I saw was in the fourth row, second seat in. Wait for the microphone. And actually, I'll take a couple questions together given the, the time. So we'll start off with yours. If you please identify yourself first. Uh, Bernard Gordon University of New Hampshire. Uh, Ambassador Valdez, it's very good, especially good to see you again. Chile isn't really an unusual situation because you were the beginners with Singapore and uh, at the very, very outset in what became TPP. But what I want to ask you is this. Correspondents from Santiago have been writing to me over the last year saying there are rumblings of upset, dissatisfaction. Uh, and you alluded to a little bit of that earlier today when you said because Chile has its own FTA with the U.S., the basic point I think that I was getting was that Chile doesn't really need the TPP. Uh, is that why there is, I mean, I hope that's not the case, but is that why there is still some reservation in Santiago? Would you help me understand that? Thanks, thanks, Bernard. I'm going to take a couple. Thank take, you. Uh, the question right here, we'll, take, we'll, we'll, we'll respond to these together. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Rita from Central News Agency, Taiwan. Uh, I got three questions. Sorry about that. The can, first one is for the. Can you, lim can you limit them? Yeah, to, I will keep it short. Can you put a combined as one, please? Thanks. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, the, the question is for the, for the Under Secretary as well. The, uh, we know that there is a negotiation with the Japan a few weeks ago about the motor vehicle meeting, I think that. Is there any development or process for the TPP that you, you, can, you can tell us? And then second one is, sorry, that I still have to ask that. And I know that we are going to get it done for the TPP. And then uh, I'm just wondering that, how about the second round negotiation? Because Taiwan is also keep saying that they want to join the, the TPP. And uh, especially that there is some reports uh, say that uh, about the, the freedom of the economy, the, the situation. The Taiwan is better than the, the TPP partnership, like Vietnam. So is there any strategic consideration for, for U.S. That, that Taiwan can be in the second negotiation for the TPP? Correct. And then, can, can sorry, we, one can more. We, can we stop it there? Uh, Do you mind? We, we have a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I think I saw the, a hand right there. And then we're going to go to Paula, and we'll, answer, we'll, we'll uh, respond to these four. Thank you. This is uh, for the Undersecretary. Uh, John Saylor, I'm with the National District Export Councils and Chairman. Uh, we have been working, obviously we represent a lot of the SMEs and we've got over 1,500 members across the United States and in all 50 states, but we have been working heavily with business coalitions and doing, fighting this thing. We, it was like preaching to the choir when you talk to the trade community. Everybody gets it, they understand it. Our problem is going out and talking to the opposition. And the opposition, of course, mm -hmm. are the problems we're having on Capitol Hill right now and trying to educate them. And we've talked about this and talked about this. And I would like, especially the Undersecretary, if you could address this or any of you, uh, talk about the opposition and what, not outside the country, because I've gone through that with the other trade agreements, a big problem. But the real problem is up here on Capitol Hill and trying to get these people to, to understand it. Because when we did CAFTA, I thought CAFTA was a no-brainer and it only passed by one vote. So it, it's, it's hard to believe. But if you could address that regarding the opposition on, on, on the Hill. Thank you. Thank, thanks, John. That's a question I had to get, just to, get to. And, and then the last, uh, wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, Paula Stern, um, on the Atlantic Council, the Stern Group. Um, uh, I'd like to build on your question uh, and give y'all the chance to articulate um, the best arguments uh, for uh, why we ha want this agreement in spite of the extraordinary headwinds which are now beginning to manifest themselves economically. The headwinds in terms of the strong dollar, which reference was made earlier, and the headwinds of simply the slowing uh, growth, uh, which also 
uh, will impact at, at least those who look at the number, uh, the trade deficit figures okay. and um, the uh, uh, role of U.S. exports overseas. Both of those are going to be enormous headwinds. I think we're already feeling it, um, and uh, which may be an argument for getting this debate going as soon as possible on the Hill. But what do you say other than, uh, well, that's Treasury's problem. All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I wrote down the questions, so, so don't, don't worry if you. The, uh, well, actually, we'll start, Ambassador, with the question specifically to you about the reservations in Chile, and then we'll move to the, to the panel to talk about the, the other ones. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. It, it, it is a very important question. In fact, uh, <clears throat> let me say that we have, during the process of the negotiation, insisted that we want a balanced agreement that our sensibilities have to be respected if the United States wants us on board, that it is a fact that we have already free trade agreements with all of the countries involved, and therefore that um, this needs a big effort in which I won't insist because the negotiation is not finished and is going through today. The secrecy uh, and the mystere, the mysterious way in which this negotiation was conducted in the past didn't help the way in which our business sector or other sectors understood the process, the negotiating process. In our experience as, as, as a country involved in trade agreements in the past, we had always had the care to consult the private sector, to consult the business organizations, to consult the labor organizations, and to discuss with the press. When we negotiated with the US, we organized a big seminar with the press in order to tell the press what we were doing. Nothing like that happened at the beginning of this or in the moment in which we uh, adhere to the negotiation. We have changed that. We are working very closely with the business sector now. And I believe that, uh, of course, and this is a cri critical point from our point of view, and in this I will be extraordinarily frank, probably more than I should be. <laughs> An economy like ours, in the level of development in which we are, there are certain topics, 21st century topics, in which to take decisions on these is extremely difficult considering the fact that we have very little idea on how these productive sectors are going to evolve in our own nations, in our relationship with other countries. Therefore, when we say we want uh, better practices, we want regulations in this or in this other sector, we are making a bet on the way in which these sectors are going to evolve. We understand that for the US this might be crucial in the negotiating process. For us, it is something that we have to work enormously to persuade our, 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 our business sector, but also in the future our members of Congress, uh, that the decision, the decision we are taking is in favor of the type of development we have chosen. Therefore, these last months are critical, and we will have to build a case in favor of not market access, because market access we already have, with the exception of Japan. The rest of the members of the CPP have already signed with us agreements which are extremely satisfying to us in market access, but that we are engaging in the other disciplines in a way which is favorable to our own development. That is our challenge. Thank you. Uh, the other question, I want to start off with uh, Under Secretary Seelig on the other questions. First, uh, there's a question on, on, on Taiwan and specifically motor vehicle, but then I'd like to get your quick thoughts and then Sean's as well as Ralph's on how do we talk to the opposition and the best arguments for, for talking to the opposition. Sure. So um, on motor vehicles, uh, I would just refer to my comment earlier, which is, you know, the hardest parts of the negotiation, the ones that are saved to the end. Uh, motor vehicles with Japan, agriculture are amongst those issues. Um, that we're going to have to tackle, and we do have in front of us, so we're all very well aware of that. As it relates to your question about um, whether or not other countries would be permitted to enter into TPP, uh, the administration, Ambassador Froman, have been quite clear that any country that has the willingness and ability to meet the high standards of these trade agreements would be welcome, and we do welcome them. 
And so um, really the onus is upon other countries um, uh, uh, to go do that. Um, as it relates to the other question um, regarding SMEs and how we best communicate um, uh, with, um, the, uh, with uh, domestic audiences on this topic, um, I think, look, it is fundamentally about um, uh, jobs and how those jobs pay. 11.3 million U American jobs are supported by companies that export, and those companies tend to pay 15 to 18% higher wages. Jobs that pay better. I think that has to be yeah. kind of drilled in to the folks uh, to folks um, uh, that are part of this debate. Sean, look, I, I think the the sales pitch on trade for the last twenty years has been tough to make, uh, and it, because it's been a period of dislocation. So, so you've, you've, you you can make the argument that 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 uh, that uh, open economies do better in the long run, but it's a long run argument. Uh, and it's and it's tough to make in, in the kind of in the immediacy of today or in the immediacy of a congressional district where factories have closed uh, because uh, manufacturing jobs have moved. So, but it also gets it, but the, the problem is also that trade gets conflated with everything, right? So 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 and trade agreements get blamed for everything, right? So technology over the last 20 yeah. years has hugely changed. Manufacturing jobs just don't take as many people as they used to. Uh, and that's, that, that, that's just the reality uh, uh, out there. Uh, globalization is, it's not something you're gonna stop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that you can be against. It is. It's, it's a force in the world today. And trade agreements, uh, as you hear from the administration, are a, a, a about how, how you shape that rightly or wrongly. I, th I tend to think sometimes uh, you know, trade, free trade agreements are less about free trade, more about uh, managing and protecting uh, some, 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 some product areas and so on. So I think the sales pitch needs to change a little bit. It also, if you look at some of the polling data out there, millennials are much more pro-globalization and pro-trade than older people who have been dislocated in the economy. And that's part of, uh, that's because they've grown up with the internet. And they've grown up with the idea that a YouTube video, uh, that Gangnam style that comes out of Korea uh, <laughs> as a kind of cultural import, right. uh, this is services trade effectively, uh, is, is okay. I can live with that, and 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 I can enjoy that, and I can and, and I can sell into it. I think the the big sales pitch that needs to change, and, and I should say that the debate that's been going on here for the last twenty years is just getting started in Europe over TTIP, and I think you see a lot of public skepticism over TTIP, and that's about questions about globalization uh, and and so on. But they haven't yet had that 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 that, that, that real debate. The sales pitch has to change, and it has to become a modern sales pitch. It has to be about digital trade. It has to be about e-commerce. Uh, it has to be about the world that we live in today. I've just moved here from London. One of the greatest things about moving over here uh, from the UK is that I can finally buy cheap clothes for my children. Uh, uh, the, uh, I can't tell you I mean, I, I, how expensive uh, uh, Children's clothes are in Europe, and I would. My wife would go on LL Bean and say, "Oh God, look at this cute top," and, and so on. And it would. We'd order it, and then it would come, and it would get hit with an import tax yeah. when it came into the UK. You want to sell trade? Open. A, talk about a global e-commerce market. Talk about. Talk to consumers about how they can benefit from that. I mean, the, you know, the, those are the kind of simple elements that need to be a bigger part of the conversation. Yeah. Ralph, your thoughts? I think Sean opened up. Well, yeah, opened great, door great on the segue. E so. Sean, thank you. Uh, that's the point I was going to make. You know, I, I gave the number earlier on about one percent of uh, of U.S. Uh, SMEs uh, exporting. But compare that to the number that eBay has been uh, publishing recently. They show that of their small percent, small SMEs that use eBay to sell their goods online. 97% of them are exporting. 1% versus 97%. What's going on there? It's the internet. It's the fact that th they're not having to go out there and find distributors. They're sitting at home taking orders from people around the world, those 4.9 billion middle class consumers who are you know, dying to find the, the products, the brands that America and other countries have because they can't get them in their countries or they can't get them at an affordable price. They go online and they see them being sold, a lot of them from the United States, and they buy them. It is a huge, huge opportunity uh, if we do 
the regulatory and the policy environment space right, that we need to facilitate this. We need to make these things, these transactions easier. They need to make it easier for the shipper who wants to fulfill these orders when they get them, uh, but they don't know how. Uh, that's where companies like FedEx come in. We come into that space between an e-tailer and the overseas consumer, uh, and we facilitate that transaction. We make it transparent so that they know what they're going to pay when the goods arrive there. We get it through customs so they don't have a big delay. Uh, and so it's a huge opportunity. Things like de minimis. This is something we've been talking about for years now. The de minimis level is the level below which a good comes into a country duty-free. There's no single policy mechanism that we could do that would do more for e-commerce is to raise de minimis levels. Because then all of a sudden, that shirt from L.L. Bean comes in, $40, there's no taxes on it. We don't have to go get a customs broker to classify that good and go through all the red tape that's necessary. It simply comes in. Thanks. Thanks. It's a better, it's a better consumer experience, and it's a huge opportunity for retailers and e-tailers around the world. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ralph. I know some of our panelists have a hard, hard stop. So, uh, if you could again join me in, in thanking our panelists for an excellent conversation. And good to meet you. And I'd like to again thank the uh, Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi for their support of their of this event, and thank the entire. Uh, Adrian Arch Latin America Center team and the Global Business Economic Center team to, for putting on today's events. So thank you again very much.